على جسر الالم بين الامل والياس قفت بعيوني دمعة وبيدي شدت ياس السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to today's show, I Remember Imam Al-Kadhim, alayhi salam. A show dedicated to looking at the life and the struggle of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far Al-Kadhim, alayhi salam. I am your host, Ali Al-Irawani, and I would like to begin by sending my condolences to you all and to our Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi Ajjal Faraja, on the shahadat of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far Al-Kadhim, alayhi salam. Joining me for my discussion today is my special guest, Minhal Al Khafaji. Welcome. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Okay, dear brother. Uh, I would like to first ask you who was Imam Al Kadhim alayhi salam? Imam Al Kadhim alayhi salam was the seventh Imam of Al Muhammad. A man who was tortured more than any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. He saw many khulafa of Bani Abbas, the likes of Al-Saffah, Al-Hadi, Al-Mahdi, Al-Mansur, and the worst of them, Harun al-Rashid, a man who tortured Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, something that none of us can imagine. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far started his imamah at the age of 20. Mm-hmm. But does that mean that his knowledge began at the age of 20? Far from it. Well, um, now that you say that, uh, I've heard that at the age of five, uh, Abu Hanifa once or twice came uh, to the house of our uh, sixth Imam, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq and um, wanted to speak to the Imam at that time, but instead spoke to a five-year-old Imam al-Musa alayhi um, I mean, was he well learned from that stage was he did he have did he show the imama from that stage already he showed his imama in the best ways possible abu hanifa who is regarded by other schools in islam mm-hmm. came to the house of imam al-sadiq alayhi salam so he knocked on the door and the young imam musa ibn ja'far comes out and he opens the door salam alaykum wa alaykum salam abu hanifa asks is your father here he says, yes, but he's a bit busy. Mm-hmm. He says, is there anything that I can help you with? Mm-hmm. He says, no, I'll wait for your father. He says, no, no, ask me. There's, there might be something, it might be something that I can mm-hmm. answer for you. Sure. Abu Hanifa says to him, he says, O Musa ibn Ja'far, when we commit a sin, is it Allah that makes us sin? Is it us and Allah? Or is it just us that we've been given the free will to sin? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far at the age of five, Mm -hmm. like you said, at the age of five, answers Abu Hanifa and he says, Oh Abu Hanifa, if it's Allah that makes us sin, then it's not fair that we get punished for Allah's doings. Of course. If it's us and Allah, then again, if Allah was part of the crime, then we it's not fair that we get punished for Mm -hmm. it. He says, therefore, we've been given the free will to sin. Sure. So you find that at that age, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far displays his imamah at the age of five years old. Thank you for that, uh, dear brother. Also, again, now that we're speaking about when he was five years old, there is another hadith uh, uh, amongst that sort of uh, time when he was very young uh, regarding prayer. Uh, because as we know, uh, our brothers from other school of thoughts, they have uh, something within their prayers they do uh, sometimes, which is uh, part of their sunnah. And uh, uh, I was wondering, would you be able to elaborate on that uh, hadith as well uh, regarding the prayer? So yes. Um, one day Abu Hanifa himself comes to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Yeah. And he says, O oh, Ja'far bin Muhammad, I think you need to go teach Musa, your son Musa, how to pray. SubhanAllah. 
Imam, Jaf uh, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq doesn't reply to him and say, you know, this is the Imam after me, uh, you know, he's an infallible respect. No. Imam, Imam al-Sadiq says to him, oh Abu Hanifa, why don't you go and teach him? Subhanallah. Yeah. You go teach the young Musa how to pray. Mm -hmm. Abu Hanifa, because Abu Hanifa's claim was that what? Was that, that the young Musa, when someone walked past him in salah, he didn't stick his hand out. Right. So Abu Hanifa goes and he says to Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he says to him, Young Musa, I need to teach you about prayers. Mm -hmm. He says, go ahead. He says to him, when someone walks past you in salah, you must stick your hand out so that they don't pass in front of to you. To stop them basically, to so stop that them they don't in interrupt your prayer or something exactly. like that. Sure, sure. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far replies, he says, Oh Abu Hanifa, during my salah I was so focused on my Lord, I didn't notice anyone walking in front of me. Subhanallah, subhanallah, sure. And that's why when we look at, when we go further into Imam, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's life, and we look at when he starts his imam, he was known as al kadhim Why was he known as al kadhim Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was known as al kadhim When you look at the Qur'an, we look at chapter 3, verse 134. Sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-kaadhimina al ghayb Right. Sure. What does it mean? It, see, it means those who restrain their anger right. And those who do good to people And Allah loves the doers of good So I gather that in that sense uh, Well I, I believe none of the Imams would But in this sense uh, Imam al Kadhim was known as uh, the calm one uh, the humble one, the more uh, sort of quiet uh, uh, and, and like you said, never really gets angry, doesn't show any anger, always refrains from uh, those kind of acts. Ahsantum. Sure. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far faced situations that it leaves the person listening to these stories, mm -hmm. you know, a bit confused. Sure. As to, you know, these are the Imams. These are what Rasulullah, he talked about them before they were even born, he, they were his awsiya, they were his caliphs sure. after him. Yeah. One, one story of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he's walking with his companions. Sure. And the man comes to him and he says, curse be on you and your father. Subhanallah. Mm -hmm. What do you do with a man like that? <laughs> <laughs> what do you reply? Yeah. Imam, Imam's companions wanted to intervene, but he said, no, have patience. I can imagine. A couple of days later, they were sitting, they were sitting down, and the Imam said, you know what, what should we do about this man? They said, we should punish him. He said, no, leave this man to me, I'll speak to him. He went and he inquired about this man. They said he's uh, in, his, uh, in his farm, plowing the soil. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far goes to his land. Assalamu alaikum. The man replies by saying, what are you doing here, you? So and so. You so and so. Mm -hmm. He swears at the Imam. Sure. Now, instead of the Imam, many of us, or some of us, if someone swears at us, we come back with ten swear words. Yeah, subhanAllah. <laughs> but Imam Musa ibn Ja'far wanted to make this as an example. Mm, sure. He disrespects you, you come back with the utmost of akhlaq. So he swears at the Imam, the Imam says, uh, the man says, you've damaged my land. Mm -hmm. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far asks him, how much did you spend on this land? He says to him, 100 dinar. Imam says, and how much do you expect to make out of this land? He says, 200 dinar. The Imam pulled out 300 dinar and gave it to the man. SubhanAllah. 
He says, I, lit- I just cursed you and your father. And you want to give me money? Oh, yeah, yeah. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far replies to him by saying, We the Ahlul Bayt are not only here to perfect the akhlaq of humanity, but our akhlaq have to be perfect as well. Of course. That's why on a, a, there's another story of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Mm-hmm. One of his servants sure. had a bucket of hot water. Okay. And he accidentally spilt it on the Imam. The Imam was covered in hot water from top to bottom. Mm-hmm. The man immediately recites the ayah from chapter 3, verse 134. <laughs> Imam Musa ibn Ja'far says, I have restrained my anger. Wal'afina <laughs> anin nas. And he says, I have forgiven you. He says, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. And he says, I have freed you for the sake of Allah. <laughs> that's, ve- that's a very beautiful one. Now, regarding uh, in the beginning, you were telling me about uh, that he's lived uh, under many Abbasid Khalifas, um, including um, uh, the very evil uh, Harun al Rashid. Uh, I wanted you to delve into that a little bit more. Maybe uh, let us know. I mean, what was their actual. Why did they have such hatred towards like the sixth Imam as well, in particular, and the seventh Imam? Um, uh, why did they, uh, because um, from history what I know is that they hated them but uh, also at the same time respected them mm-hmm. a lot, especially Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi uh, salam. Maybe if you uh, uh, let us know, I mean, how was it uh, uh, living under these tyrants? I mean, what was their uh, uh, vendetta against them, if you want to say it in so many words? The Imam, the Imam, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far would fa- faced Harun al-Rashid, which was arguably one of the most tyrannical leaders of Bani Abbas. Sure. The Imam one day, Harun al-Rashid comes to him and he says, O oh Musa ibn Ja'far, why is it that you, the sons of Ali, think you're better than us, the sons of Abbas? Right. So that's Bani Abbas, they're, they're the sons the of cousins. the uncle of the Prophet. Yeah, so they're cousins. So they're essence. cousins. Sure. And, 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 and they, they feel that uh, the children of Fatima al-Zahra think that they're better than them. Although they're showing that they're uh, more respectable and they're more humble, those Khulafa, that's, that was their main sort of envy and hatred towards them. Ahsan. So Harun al-Rashid, Asks him, why do you, the sons of Ali, think you're better? Imam Musa ibn Ja'far replies by saying, O oh Harun, we, the sons of Ali, are from the line of Abu Talib. Abu Talib and Abdullah, the father of the Prophet, have the same mother and father. Mm-hmm. Whereas Abbas has a different mother. Right. Harun replies to him by saying, Yes, but Abu Talib died and Abbas remained alive. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, Abu Talib died in the early ages of Islam. Sure. Whereas Abbas lived to see the Battle of Hunayn Mm -hmm. and the likes. Sure. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, he says, yes, but the message of Rasulullah remains with his children. Mm-hmm. Not his uncle. So he was arguing the, the, the lineage from the mother's side instead of the father's side. Exactly. So he's saying we are from our father, yet you come from Fatima Zahra, who is a woman. Exactly. And so uh, uh, the Arabs at that time didn't take the lineage from a female, they took it from a male in essence. Exactly. Sure. So Imam Musa ibn Ja'far would reply to him and he said, O oh Harun. If Rasulullah came and proposed for your daughter right now, would you give it? Would you allow him to marry your daughter? Mm-hmm. He said, "Yes, it would be my honor." Imam replies to him by saying, "That's for your case, but we wouldn't because he is the father of our mother. Therefore, our line is a direct line, whereas yours is an indirect connection." Subhanallah. Subhanallah. 
Right. Um, now that uh, we've covered the the, the tyrants, uh, I would like to I would like you to uh, maybe explain to us what was the reason that they imprisoned him? Because we know that many imams lived under under tyrannical leaders and 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 and, and so on, but uh, not all of them were imprisoned. What was it, and why was it that, uh, in particular, the seventh Imam, Imam Musa Kadhim, was imprisoned? For the last 15 years of his life, he went to over five prisons. There are two reasons why Imam Musa ibn Ja'far was imprisoned. Mm -hmm. The first reason leads on to the second reason. Right. The first reason he was imprisoned was the story that we just talked about, which was that Imam Musa ibn Ja'far explains why that the sons of Abu Talib and the sons of Ali right. are better than the sons of Abbas. Okay, so it, it sort of uh, upset Harun al-Rashid. So it was more like um, uh, what, how the Imam spoke to him and exactly. what he said to him. So exactly. there wasn't actually like a, a physical act yes. against the law or anything like no. that. Right. The second reason, and sometimes when you hear this next story, you think that sometimes it's the closest ones to you that end up being the cause of your death. SubhanAllah. Harun al-Rashid was sitting down with a man by the name of Yahya al-Barmaki. Mm -hmm. He was sitting down with him and he wanted a reason to imprison Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. He wanted to keep Imam Musa ibn Ja'far under his eye. Mm -hmm. Yahya al-Barmaki says, leave this to me. Yahya al-Barmaki goes to who? Ali ibn Ismail. The brother of the Imam. Ismail is the brother of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Right. Son of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. So his nephew, basically. His nephew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He writes to Ali ibn Ismail and he says, if you come from Medina to Baghdad and spread a rumor about Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, we will give you a certain amount of money. Sometimes money is the cause of the destruction of a community. SubhanAllah. Ali ibn Ismail agrees. As he's leaving from Medina to go to Baghdad, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far stops him and he says, my, my dear nephew Ali, mm -hmm. where are you going? He said, I'm heading to Baghdad. He says to him, and what do you have to do in Baghdad? He says, I have some debts, I want to pay them off. He says, oh Ali, I will pay your debts off. SubhanAllah. I will pay them off, just mm -hmm. stay in Medina. He said, no, 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 I, I want to go. He said, do you have any advice for me, oh my uncle? He says to him, the Imam says, and this is where, this point is where you know that these Imams are chosen by Allah and Allah. SubhanAllah. The Imam, he says, do you have any advice for me, O oh my uncle? He says, O oh Ali, do not be the cause of my bloodshed and my families. Mm -hmm. So he already had an inclination as to what his nephew was going to do in Baghdad. He knew what his nephew was going to sure, do. Sure, sure. But he advised him. He said, oh Ali, here's 300 dinar. Take it with you. Ali takes, uh, goes and heads towards Baghdad. Imam's companion says to him, Imam, don't you know what he's going to do? He says, so why did you give him the 300 dinar? The Imam says, Rasulullah says that look after your dear ones mm -hmm. and your relatives. If they wrong you, that's Allah's concern. But do right by them. Do right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the patience of the Imam. That goes back to why he was called Al-Kadhim. Because whenever someone disrespected him, mm -hmm. he came back with the best of akhlaq. Right, on that. Uh, quickly, uh, I mean, how did he react to the hardship that he faced uh, in prison uh, and during that time? Uh, I mean, as you're saying, they call him Al-Kadhim, but how did he, 
how how did he react to all the, all those years in prison and, and 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 not being around his family, for example? So going back to the story of why he was in prison, when Ali bin Ismail gets to the castle of Harun al Rashid, yeah, sure. He says, "You know that Musa in Medina." Mm -hmm. He says, "Yes." By the way, Harun al Rashid had his courtiers with him. Right. He says, yes, what about this Musa? He said he's collecting weapons in Medina and he is mobilizing an army to overthrow your caliphate. This is his nephew saying this. This is his nephew right, spreading sure, a rumor sure. okay. about him. In Baghdad. In Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Harun al Rashid said, now do you agree that I can arrest him and put him in my prison? He said, yes. And he arrested Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Ali ibn Ismail inquired about the money that they agreed on. Yeah. Yahya al Barmaki takes out an envelope and he hands it to him. <laughs> How much did Imam Musa ibn Ja'far give him? 300 dinars. 300 isn't it? Dinars. Sure. Ali ibn Ismail walks out of the castle of Harun al Rashid, mm -hmm. opens the envelope, and finds 200 dinars. Wow. So even less than what his uncle had given him in the first place. He let down his uncle and his grandfathers. Now, going back to how he reacted to... And I believe, sorry to cut you off, I believe that he died before the Imam as well. I believe that on the same spot when he saw the 200 dinars, he had a heart attack or a stroke and he literally died on the same spot. Is yes, he had, he had a... He choked and he died on the spot. On the spot. He was shocked. Subhanallah. He thought that he was going to get in the thousands. 200 dinar And the Imam knew and gave him more already gave him more. Subhanallah Now going back to how the Imam reacted Yeah, sure To his imprisonment Or Most his circumstances, us, sorry, his circumstances in general I mean, how did he react to it? But yeah, for example, the prison Most of us If we were to even face Hardship Oh Allah, why me? SubhanAllah, yeah. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, the first prison he went to was in Basra. Mm -hmm. Second prison he was in, or the next prison that he went to, was the prison of Fadl bin Rabi'. Fadl bin Rabi'. sorry. Mm -hmm. Fadl bin Rabi'. sure. The prison of Fadl bin Rabi'. As soon as he entered... He said, Ya Allah, all my life, I have wanted a place where I can worship you on my own. Now you've given me that honor, Ya Allah, I thank you. That's how he reacted to going into prison. That's how he wow. Most of us, even to the viewers watching this right now, mm -hmm. would we react like this? Definitely or would we say, not. Oh Allah, why me? Of course. Why 100%. have you put me through this hardship? Mm -hmm. There was one narration that says Fadl bin Rabi' has next he was going into his prison and he has he has Ahmad al Qizwini next to him. Mm -hmm. He says, Look closely into that cell, what do you see? He said, I see a white robe. Mm -hmm. He said, That's Musa ibn Ja'far in sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. Another hardship he faced was that Harun al-Rashid sent into Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's cell the most beautiful woman in Arabia. SubhanAllah. She said to him, Oh man, anything you want from me, I'll give you. And Imam Musa ibn Ja'far did not reply. She said, Oh man, anything you want from me, I will give you. He didn't reply. She said it a third time. He said, oh woman, oh lady. Why would I take what you have offered when Allah has offered more? Subhanallah. This was the Imam's answer to this lady that's this in the, the prison with him. To wow. To a point where Harun al-Rashid's soldiers, his guards, his prison guards, they walk into his, in, they walk into Imam Musa ibn Ja'far's cell. Yeah. And they found the woman in sujood behind Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. 
his eloquence mm -hmm. and his knowledge and his patience. Then he was taken to a prison known as the prison of Essindi, mm -hmm. which is in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Normally a prison cell, you'd have a bed, you'd have a bit of room, you'd have space. Yeah. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, the prison of Essindi, was a cylindrical prison. Yes, that's correct. Where yeah. he could just about stand mm -hmm. and he couldn't sit down because of how tight it was. And Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, many of us neglect our salah. Mm -hmm. Many of us, when it comes to salah, I'll pray it in an hour. Yeah, sure. Many of us, you know, I'll do a qadha with all my salahs, five at a time. At midnight, finish it quickly. Finish it quickly. <laughs> sure. Finish all five in five minutes. Yeah. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far in this prison would would tell the guards because bear in mind they had a rock, a big rock placed on top of his prison, right. so he couldn't tell the difference between day, day and, and night. night. Mm -hmm. He would ask the the guards of the cells. He would say, when you attempt to pray your salah, please let me know so I know when to pray my salah. In the biggest and worst of hardships, he would always perform his salah on time. While he was in prison, was there other, I mean, I know you just explained about the uh, Sindhi prison. Uh, the, the tube you were saying that, that there was no space to maneuver, lay, pray or anything. Was there any other uh, ways that they tortured or made the Imam to suffer in, in, in prison? The Imam would, one day they removed this big rock from the top of the, of the prison. And the Imam sticks his head out to see the different, to see, to see the daylight. And one of the soldiers kicks him on his face. Mm -hmm. Another slaps him. Another kicks him again. Mm -hmm. This man, the inheritor of knowledge of Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib mm -hmm. and Fatima al-Zahra. The man who, who taught some of the greatest scholars. The man who the other schools in Islam, when they revere and they have the four Imams that they have, many of them don't know that Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq and Imam Musa ibn Ja'far taught them. SubhanAllah. Mm -hmm. They don't know that this man converted people that, he, that you'd not think he would convert. For example, Harun al-Rashid was sending some people from different countries, different countries that didn't speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. And he would send them into the prison cell of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. And they would come out as Muslims. SubhanAllah. He said, you, I sent you in there to kill him. <laughs> they said he started speaking in our language. He, right. His words are words of eloquence. His akhlaq are at the top. SubhanAllah. Right. Um, now that we're coming uh, towards the end of part one, I wanted to ask you, we want to um, sort of get towards the martyrdom of Imam al-Kadhim. Before we get to the martyrdom of Imam al-Kadhim, there is one uh, issue uh, that I wanted you maybe to uh, give us um, some details about or speak mm -hmm. about maybe, is that the fact that uh, both Imam uh, Ja'far al-Sadiq and Imam Musa al-Kadhim uh, both married women uh, from North Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, in our modern day society, we have a lot of issues where, for example, Iraqis stick to Iraqis, Syrians stick with Syrians, Pakistanis stick with Pakistanis, or a Sayyid can't marry someone that's not an Alawiyah. Uh, is there a reason, do you think that there's a reason that the Imams uh, uh, married somebody from, say, for example, not from Medina, where they're from, or that wasn't an Alawiyah, for example? I mean, is that also them sending us a message to say, listen, Marry from amongst each other, for example. That's exactly why. 
where uh, Imam, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, you find that not just one of them, many of them married from North Africa. Mm -hmm. Now, when someone comes and says, you know, in in our day, when we want to get married, you can only marry from our country. You can only marry from our city. The Imams they don't want this racism to happen. If Islam was only for one country, then it would have remained in this country. Sure. The Isla Islam is for humanity. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when you find someone who's who's got akhlaq, who loves the Ahlul Bayt, who prays, who fasts, what's the what's the shame in marrying her? Thank you, brother. Now, if we can just take it towards the martyrdom of Imam Al Kadhim the Imam. One of his companions come towards him. They man he manages to get into his prison cell. And he says, Imam, your Shia are waiting for you. Your Shia are waiting for you. When are you going to come out? Imam Musa ibn Jafar looks at him and he says, This Friday, in the morning, meet me on the bridge of Baghdad. The companion leaves and he has a smile on his face. He goes and he tells the Shia, prepare for the arrival of your Imam. That's why when the famous speaker says that when someone comes up to him and says, Sayyidna, I can't be religious. We have an Imam in Ghaybah. Mm -hmm. You had an Imam for 15 years who was in Ghaybah. Yeah, subhanallah. His Shia didn't know of him and his Shia did, couldn't see him. So the man goes and he prepares the Shia for the arrival of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Everyone is celebrating and joyous that the Imam is going to be released. Come Friday of that morning, there is an announcement. There is a janazah on the bridge of Baghdad. So the companions of the Imam, because they learn from the Imam, when a person dies, you go to help the family. Mm -hmm. You go to see what's going on, if they need anything, to help them through their hardship. The man, the man who found the body, said, does this man have any family? The companion said, why? He said, because the poison has covered his body. He sh his family should claim blood money. And his companions come. And they find the body of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far lying there. Thank you, Brother Minhal. That was very beautiful. Thank you very much for that. Um, right, stay tuned with us. Uh, up next, we have an exclusive interview. Uh, with a former prisoner, so please stay tuned to find out his story. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum. Ala jisr al alam, bain al amal wal yas. Gafut, baayuni dama, ubidi shaddat ya. It was a glorified prison, in all honesty. The regime, they use propaganda to make everything seem perfect in our land. But it was far from perfect. The people have no freedom of speech. To lightly criticize the regime is enough to get you imprisoned, or even worse. But in my country, people are imprisoned and tortured. Wallah, they use the most inhuman of treatment towards prisoners. Things that the Prophet Muhammad would never use. The government control everything and everyone. So much is censored, but it doesn't take much for a person to realize that not everything is as it seems. There is no religious freedom there. Ethnic minorities, women 
and the vulnerable are oppressed on a daily basis. I just couldn't take it any longer. The hypocrisy and the evil, all of it just disgusted me. Yeah, I thought to myself, how can I do this? I was afraid of being caught and imprisoned. I was afraid of what could happen to my family. I tried to push the idea out of my mind, but it became difficult. Difficult to ignore. How could I sit back and watch all of this injustice happen? How can I stay silent? I couldn't do it. My mouth burned to speak out and my arms and legs willed me to make a move. I started campaigning online and to my amazement, I found so many people who shared the same views that I did. For a short while, I was so happy because I felt like I was contributing to change. But soon afterwards, I was tracked down and arrested. The treatment I received was awful. All I had done was speak out against the wrongs in my nation, and yet I was treated like the worst of criminals, the worst of humans. I was dragged out of my house in front of my family. My children were so frightened. I was left traumatized by all of this, watching their father get carried away. The officers swore at me and dragged me into the car. I was taken to a dirty and overcrowded prison. They threw me in there and didn't give me any information whatsoever. I didn't know what was going to happen to me or how long I was going to be held there. There was no air in the cell. The air was so bad and the smell was so horrendous, horrific. So many of the inmates got sick, got ill, viruses, diseases. But alhamdulillah, Allah spared me of that. Thankfully, we were given water, but the food they gave us was inedible. And for the short time I was there, I lost so much weight. I became frail, skinny. They would take me out of the cell and question me. They would beat and humiliate me. It was unbearable. And I suffered a lot, it got so bad that I wished for death. All I wanted to do was die and for this to be over. It was a miracle. Every day I would recite salawat hundreds of times and I would speak to each of the ma'sumin alayhum salam. I felt so hopeless. But alhamdulillah I was released. Going back to my family was so emotional. My wife had suffered so much since my imprisonment and she cried so hard when she saw me. She saw how skinny and weak I was and the marks of torture on me and she wept. I think just seeing her in such a state was even worse than what I had gone through. Alhamdulillah, we were able to get out of the country and I received the help that I needed. I had been emotionally and physically scarred by what happened to me. I had been diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a condition which involves me having flashbacks of the torture and increased levels of anxiety in my everyday life. But by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm overcoming this, but it's really taken its toll on me. I have never related as much to Imam Al Qadim salam until I underwent this experience. Just his name alone inspires me. Musa ibn Ja'far Al Qadim. The fact that he could look his enemies in the face, who insulted him and cursed him, and yet he remained calm and restrained from anger and was respectful towards them. This simply amazes me. It mesmerizes me. If someone cursed you or your parents in front of you, would you be able to remain so calm? I don't think so. And to think that what Imam Al Qadim salam, went through was so much worse than what I experienced. The final prison he was put in was so much worse. 
It was so small, he couldn't even sit down. He was squatted at all times. He couldn't even tell if it was day, at, day or night because they placed a rock above the cell. Couldn't even tell what the times of prayer was, whether it was Fajr or time for Maghrib. All this for a man who was sent as a mercy to mankind. It's disgusting. They tried to beat and humiliate him, but he was so strong. They even sent in the most beautiful woman to tempt him. But he said, nothing in this dunya can offer me as, good, as much as Jannah can offer me. Allah offers me more than what you can offer me. How many men can say they made such a statement? He was grateful for all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him. Even when he was thrown in prison for t up to 25 years. And this is something I try to remember every day and thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have been set free and that I have so much goodness in my life. I feel so grateful to my master, Imam al-Qadim alayhi salam and hope that the viewers can appreciate the Imam because that's what he deserves. He deserves our appreciation. He deserves our empathy. And he deserves our du'as. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ala jisr al-alam Bain al-amal wal-yaas Gafut Ba'yuni dam'a Ubeidi shaddat yaas Wow, subhanallah, uh, that was a very sad story and situation we just heard of the brother. Um, Allah is and um, how do you how do you feel about that story, brother Minhal? I mean, of of course it's a sad uh, situation, uh, but the fact that he was able to keep his faith mm -hmm. and his iman and his love for Ahlul Bayt in this situation, uh, I mean. Maybe give us a reaction to this. It's not something new that the religion of Islam sees tyrannical leaders like this. Mm -hmm. Where when you speak out against them and against their, against their hypocrisy, they come back and imprison you and torture you. What I love about this brother's story is that he spoke out even though he was inside the prison. Yeah. He truly learned from the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt, which is whenever you're in a situation where you see injustice, you always speak about, speak out about, uh, against it. Which links back to some of the companions of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, you had the companion of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, Bahlul. Mm -hmm. Bahlul and two other companions of Imam Musa ibn Ja'far visit him, visit the Imam whilst he's in prison. Mm -hmm. They say, Imam, you're away. And we have no one to guide us. Give us some advice on what we should do mm -hmm. to keep the to keep to keep the message of Rasulullah going, to keep the to keep the knowledge of Al Muhammad going. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far replies with the letter Jim. Subhanallah. Just Jim. He doesn't tell them anything else. Or... Just Jim. Mm -hmm. He just says the letter Jim. The first companion. Interpreted Jim as Jabal. Mm -hmm. So he went to go live in the mountains. Mm -hmm. The second companion interpreted Jim as Jala Anil Watan, mm -hmm. which means living in another country, country, abandoning this country and going to live in another country. Sure. Bahlul said, I know what Jim means. Mm -hmm. Jim is Junoon. SubhanAllah. I'm going to act insane. 
to preserve the teachings of Al Muhammad. Bahlul started to act insane. <laughs> but when he'd act insane, he would say words that are words of wisdom. One story is Bahlul is in the castle of Harun al Rashid and he's jumping up and down, up and down, up and down on the chair of Harun al Rashid. Harun al Rashid's guards and companions, they come and they start hitting Bahlul. Bahlul starts crying. Harun comes in and he says, Why is Bahlul crying? Mm -hmm. They say, they say to him, Bahlul was jumping on your chair, our master. <laughs> How dare anyone sit and touch and stand on the chair of our master, let alone jump on it. He said, Bahlul, is this true? Is this why you're crying? He said, no, I cry for a man like you. Mm -hmm. What will you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're sitting and you've taken the haqq of Al Muhammad and the sons of Fatima al Zahra alayhi as salam? Another story is Bahlul says to Harun al Rashid, give me the keys to the prisons of Baghdad. He says, what do you want to do with the keys mm -hmm. to the prisons of desert? There are criminals in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He says, I just want to play with the, with the keys. Please, please. He says, very well. He takes, he takes the keys and he gives them to Bahlul. An hour later, the guards of Harun and Rashid come panicking. Harun, the prisoners have been released. They've escaped. Every single one of them is gone. Harun, Bahlul. He said, where is Bahlul? <laughs> where is he? Mm -hmm. I think you know where I'm going with this. Yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> they said, Bahlul is in the graveyard. Subhanallah. Harun comes to Bahlul and he says, oh Bahlul, I gave you the keys. Why did you release him? He said, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Is there anything I can do to... To you know, to to make it easier, to make it easier for my punishment. Yeah, yeah. He says to him, "Yes, if you capture all of them, and you bring them all back to the prisons, then I'll forgive you." He says, "Very well. Let's wait here in the graveyard because there's one day when they'll all be back here." Subhanallah. Meaning that they all will die eventually and come to the they graveyard anyway. Subhanallah. And Bahlul was trying to highlight to Harun al Rashid. Think about what you're doing because you're, you're not going to take any of the castle that you have, the mm -hmm. money that you have, the jewellery that you have. Mm -hmm. You're not taking it with you to the grave. Subhan you're going to come here next to all of these people. Saying that, on that note, uh, before we end the show uh, quickly, um, you're talking about uh, worldly possessions and things like that. It's also very uh, clear to us and, and for all to see that, uh, as you said in the beginning of the show, Imam Musa al-Kadhim lived under many tyrants, several tyrants, I should say. Now, if you go back to Iraq, you won't see much of their palaces left or any at all, or any of their worldly possessions. However, if you go to al Qadhimiyah in Baghdad, mm -hmm. You see, Imam Musa al Kadhim has Allah. the biggest palace now, mashallah. May Allah grant May Allah all the grant viewers and everyone to go visit Imam Musa al Kadhim. And there was one other story <coughs> that is worth mentioning, which is Harun one day comes to Bahlul and he says, You know, Bahlul, mm -hmm. you're insane. <laughs> but sometimes you speak words of wisdom. SubhanAllah. He says, Bahlul, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says, go ahead. He says, you know the Sarat? He says, what's going to happen on that Sarat? Do you know what's going to happen? He says, no. He says, no, 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 tell me. He says, okay, I do know. <laughs> he says to him, bring me a pot. Light a fire. Mm -hmm. Bring some water. And put a plate on top of the pot. He says, now we play a game. He said to him, I will stand on the pot and I will say my name, mm -hmm. what I eat, what I drink and what I own in this world. Mm -hmm. And he says, you have to do the exact same as me. So Bahlul gets on. 
He says, my name is Bahlul. I eat a bit of bread, I drink a bit of water, and I own nothing in this world. He says, Harun, it's your turn. Wow. <laughs> We're going to be there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on, brother. Harun al-Rashid stands on the plate and he says, My name is Harun al-Rashid. <laughs> I eat and I drink alcohol and I drink water and I drink this and I eat meat and I... And he jumped off. He said, what's the matter? Mm -hmm. You didn't even get to the things you possess and mm -hmm. you jumped off. <laughs> SubhanAllah. He said, it got a bit hot. He said, if you can't handle this, then how will you handle the Sarat when Allah asks you about the possessions that you took from the sons of Fatima? SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Thank you very much, my brother Minhal. Um, that is it for today. Uh, I hope all the viewers enjoyed it, and I hope, inshaAllah, you all get to visit the shrine of Imam Al Musa Kadhim, alayhi salam, and also. Uh, all the other imams insha'Allah uh, and I hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see you next time insha'Allah Assalamu alaikum Ala jisr al-alam Bain al-amal wal-yas Gafut بعيوني دمعة وبيدي شدت ياس